Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Could protection from energy development be coming to Grand Canyon National Park and Chaco Culture National Historical Park? As we reported on The Traveler last week, the U.S. House of Representatives has passed measures to provide such protection. What remains to be seen is whether the Senate will go along. We also alerted you to plans to expand cellular coverage in Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah about the staggering loss of tricolored bats at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky and of the successful rescue of a woman lost in Sequoia National Park in California. You can find those and other stories at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, Erica Zambello and Dr. Alex Dagan, the CEO and co-founder of Conservation X Labs, an organization working to end human-induced extinction, discuss the first national parks in Afghanistan and the challenges of conservation in a war zone. We also outline a Senate resolution to protect a much larger slice of nature in the United States than is currently being done, and outline a winter's visit to Virgin Islands National Park in the Caribbean. Hi everyone, it's Erica, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Alex Dagan, evolutionary biologist, and CEO and co-founder of Conservation X Labs. And I met you four years ago when I was a graduate student at Duke and you were teaching a seminar type course on innovation. And you've recently published The Snow Leopard Project and Other Adventures in War Zone Conservation. And we wanna to talk to you today about national parks in Afghanistan. So thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to be here, Erica. So you lived in Afghanistan for years, working on wildlife surveys and setting up national parks. That's not a common thing you find on somebody's resume. So how did you find yourself in Afghanistan in the early 2000s? Yeah, so I, you know, I had spent a considerable amount of time originally in Madagascar trying to understand why certain species go extinct and others survive environmental change, particularly looking at the world's most endearing species, which in my opinion are lemurs, but snow leopards are pretty close. Uh, and uh, when I came back from those three years, three years of literally living in a tent, 9-11 um, occurred and I decided to sort of turn down the academic opportunities I had, at, uh, which were at Yale Forestry, uh, and to go work for the State Department and found myself in Iraq rebuilding science. Uh, and working on things like the wetlands in Iraq. So when I was reporting out uh, during the Society of Conservation Biology meetings in New York City at Columbia University, uh, Peter Zoller, the Assistant Asia Director of the Wildlife Conservation Society, came up to me after my talk and asked me, you know, would I be interested in helping set up the first national park in Afghanistan? And you don't get asked a chance, you, know, you don't get asked that question very often. Right. So uh, it was, uh, of course, I said yes. Uh, but then I had to check with my significant other, who's still with me, and because uh, we had just moved in, and uh, whether she'd be willing to go. And she said yes, which is how I knew she was the one. The one, yes. And, you know, who is now the mother of my children. So I would say that. I would just assume that 99.9% .9 of our listeners have never been to Afghanistan. So That's a good assumption. Given that it's a, a large country, a biodiverse country, can you just paint a picture of the landscapes that you were working with? Yeah, it is incredibly beautiful. And the sad thing about all the coverage that we hear about is none of that beauty is reflected in the images of that country. Uh, of uh, that's on the media that's that that we see in the newspapers it is really of dust and warfare and death and Afghanistan is actually I think one of the most beautiful countries on our planet and much as it is a uh, you know has been historically part of the cultural silk road 
that connected Africa and Europe and the Middle East to to China uh, and the Far East and Southeast Asia, it is very much a biological Silk Road that brought together, uh, you know, European and Arctic fauna and and Eurasian fauna, African fauna and Indo-Malaysian fauna in a single country. Uh, so you, and one of the reasons it does so is it has a phenomenal amount of habitat from, you know, massive amounts of mountains and topography. There's this place, uh, the Wahong Corridor, which is part of the Pamir Knot. Uh, it's referred to locally as the roof of the world. It is where you have the Kunlun, Tian Shan, Pamir, Hindu Kush mountains all come crashing together and just creating, you know, amazing mountain landscapes, these high, high U-shaped values that is literally what the Pamirs refers to, glaciers tumbling down uh, into roadless valleys uh, that just stretch for miles. Uh, and it's so high in elevation and so steep in its topography that the north-south bird migration actually turns east-west. Wow. Uh, to pass through this corridor. Um, you also have these high plateau regions that kick out into the middle of the country. So the first area really refers to what is the western end of the Himalayas. The second area is this, this, this massive fist of mountains and plateaus that go into the heart of the country. And there you have landscape that looks a lot like Utah. Uh, and the American Southwest, where you have an area that will remind you of the Grand Canyons um, that circle around a set of six uh, travertine lakes. And travertine, as you may remember, is like travertine marble. Uh, yeah. It is, you know, these lakes are filled with super saturated calcium carbonate, the same uh, material that, that is also used in the production of slagtites and slagmites except what they do is they form these glistening dams around the edges of those lakes. Uh, the dams themselves are tens of meters high and they trap this azure blue water in the middle of this red banded ruddy landscape uh, where the tops of those plateaus are around 8,000 feet and are filled with marine fossils because at some point this used to be the bottom of the ocean. You then have in the far west, you have these pistachio savanna lands that might remind you of the Sahel and the savannas of East Africa. Uh, and, um, you know, where you've got incredible species like the Asiatic wild ass living there and actually an Afghan, uh, what we believe is an Asiatic cheetah that still may have persisted in that area. Um, and is down to 40 individuals worldwide. It's a separate subspecies than the African cheetah. And then in the far south, you have in the southeast, you have this huge wetlands area uh, where the Helmand River comes into and meets Iran. Uh, and then in the southeast, this incredible red desert that um, is incredibly hot. Uh, and with its own entire, you know, red sand, uh, just for, for, for hundreds of miles, uh, and, uh, and all these areas are different in their topography. And then one last area is also really cool is, which you wouldn't expect is dense forests, dense for mountainous forests on these hillsides that are so steep that people feel like there are parts of the valleys where the trees could almost touch each other from opposite sides uh, that are filled with deciduous oak and conifer species. Uh, and in this area, you have things like snow leopards and you have jackals and you have hyenas and you have something called the marhor, which is a twin horn unicorn. Uh, that's pretty spectacular. And then in the Himalayas, you of course have snow leopards. And one of the coolest of all things, the Marco Polo sheep, what I like to call the Princess Leia sheep, uh, the biggest of the mountain sheep in the world, whose horns are six feet long if you follow the curve. So it's kind of a, there are other habitats as well. There are woody wetlands. 
uh, where tigers in Afghanistan uh, resided up until 1965, um, 67, somewhere around then. Um, it's a spectacular place for conservation. Yeah, it just sounds stunning. And so you arrive with your team and you're charged with doing surveys in these remote areas for wildlife, you know, haven't been surveyed. But you're also in charge of creating some of the first, no, the first national parks in Afghanistan. So what were the overarching goals of creating national parks in this country that is stunning, biodiverse, but also war-torn? Yeah. So, I mean, what you exactly called it. We, one of the things we had to figure out was, were there any animals left? We had uh, 30 years of warfare, the Soviet invasion, the Afghan civil war, the U.S. invasion, you know, a continual, a continual low intensity warfare in Afghanistan. Um, what did this do? You know, the third most heavily mined country in the world. What effects did that actually have uh, on the wildlife of the country? And it kind of goes two ways, right? On one hand, things like mine actually uh, and forcing people off the land then means that uh, many of the species are, are unbothered, uh, that they're actually protected, much like the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Uh, but other things like the bombardment of habitats like the caves on the Afghan-Pakistan border, which are hosts to numerous uh, endemic and local species, you know, endemic species of bats, uh, was devastating uh, for those species. The literally, there's a almost a geological era uh, in the soil horizon of Afghanistan that I call the Bellocene because you dig down in so many places and just find find gun casings. And then the biggest issue is just so many people now have guns mm -hmm. in Afghanistan left over from the conflict that's that's used there. But our goal was to do, uh, you know, to do these things, understand what happened to the wildlife, help build the institutions, the National Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Agriculture, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, for in Afghanistan, which both had important jurisdiction over over natural resources stand up new environmental laws, working with other institutions like the UN Environmental Program, UN Development Program, and then uh, fundamentally actually build the things that are necessary for management and the creation of the national parks, which are the park infrastructure itself, the development of rangers, of guards, of park staff, of mechanisms for equitable sharing of revenue and then the the most important part of it was to ensure that there were mechanisms for the local people who live in the park to 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 be able to manage that park alongside the national government the provincial government and the local government so literally we had elected officials for that first national park which is Banda Amir that's the Travertine Lakes that I mentioned earlier, where they were all elected from their villages uh, that were all within the watershed of those six lakes. Uh, and, and they were amazing because they took their role really carefully and really seriously. Yeah. And um, I highly recommend our listeners check out the book. It's just an amazing um, map of the twists and turns you had to take to really finish these monumental efforts that you're describing to get the national parks, you know, on the ground. And minor spoiler alert, unless you have Google and you can just look it up, but Afghanistan does have national parks now, uh, partially as a result or mostly as a result of your team's efforts. And so you've mentioned it a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit about the very first Afghanistan national park and, you know, what drew you to that area in particular to start your efforts? Yeah, I, I mean, some of the reasons that were there. So it's it's habitat of the Persian leopard and of the ibex, uh, which is significant in itself. Um, but it was also uh, it's also geologically really important. Um, it physically looks like the landscapes of Arizona and Utah, uh, particularly the Grand Canyon. And then you add on top of that these very delicate, incredibly beautiful travertine lakes, uh, 
Uh, you know, and the way to imagine it is if you've been to Mammoth Hot Springs or other hot springs that have those pools that have a uh, that are kind of rimmed at the edges by minerals. Imagine those rims creating a basin, except that are tens of meters tall, uh, trapping in you know incredibly blue water. So it was really important geologically. Uh, and as a place of incredible beauty, it was also the second most important Shia shrine in the country. So it was a place of pilgrimage. And then there were two partially carved Buddhas that were right at the edge of the main lake uh, that were never completed. And it's 60 miles from where the Colossi, the giant Buddhas of Bamiyan that were blown up by the Taliban were. So this was an important stopover point on the Silk Road itself. It was Bamiyan itself, which is the province, but also the name of the capital city where the park is near, uh, was an important monastery and center of learning of Buddhism. And then you have these uh, marine fossils that are packed into the cliffs uh, above the lake, uh, above the lakes uh, themselves. So there were a lot of reasons to protect it. But the other one was, it was the closest thing to becoming a national park in 1979 <laughs> until, and then, you know, they were just about to declare it and then the Soviets invaded. And so we felt for all those reasons, um, this was the first one to, to, to create, but it wasn't the last one, which is, which is a great thing. But one of the, one of the cool things, if I can mention it is the fact that, um, it it uh, now just celebrated its tenth anniversary. It has a hundred thousand or hundred and seventy thousand visitors a year, wow. and ninety nine percent of and there's a story on CNN about it. You can look it up, but ninety nine percent of them were Afghan, which means that this wasn't something imposed by the West, but something that is really appreciated by the Afghans and desired by the Afghans themselves, which is really critical. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, you know, you mentioned it's 2019 now. You started your work in 2006. How many parks are there and are there any on the horizon given the precarious political situation that Afghanistan once again has found itself in? It definitely is in a precarious situation, but what has been really incredible is the enthusiasm that people showed for conservation. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I can digress just for one second, which is uh, Afga you know, these parks actually represented for people, 5.6 million of which were refugees. It gave them a sense of identity of what it meant to be Afghan, that these animals that were sort of unique mix of these animals, this biological silk road that brought together this, this crossing of all these, you know, three different regions of the world, um, allowed people to kind of regain their identity after 30 years of being refugees and 30 years of conflict. So we did, we actually, it was the easiest place for me to actually ever do conservation. We didn't suffer from the problems of corruption that other people had. We had huge amounts of support from the local populace to the provincial leaders, to the national leaders, to the individual villages. Uh, and that just made the job uh, really easy. But I think there are now four national parks and more on the way. Uh, one of the biggest is the Wakhan National Park. <laughs> we were originally looking at creating three much smaller parks. And in the end, they ended up taking the Wakhan, which is that peninsula that sticks out of the, the, the northeast of Afghanistan. It literally was the dividing line between the Russian and British empires during the Great Game, and it was set up as a buffer zone, which is why it's there. It touches China, it touches Kazakhstan and Pakistan, uh, Tajikistan and, and Pakistan, and the the, the this area. It, it, by the way, the biggest time zone difference in the world is when you walk across the Afghan border because China is on one time zone. For the whole country and Afghanistan's on another. So you reset your watch three and a half hours uh -huh. just walking across a few inches. Uh, uh, but that became another national park. Uh, a couple of the wetlands in the south have become national parks. Uh, a former protected area of the King uh, has, has also become a park. Um, so there's a lot of new areas. Uh, 
that are there. And the WCS program is still working there, which I really find, uh, although that they're more, you know, they're mostly working now in, in the Wakhan and the, in the Western end of the Himalayas, that to me is conservation optimism that, you know, even in one of the most difficult places to work uh, in the world in many ways for security, for the logistics, for even things like literacy. When we got to Afghanistan, literacy rates were, you know, between 15 and 30% on average, depending on, your, you know, women were around 15%. The average rate was around 21%. So you're starting from there when you're just trying to recruit staff and build up, you know, Afghan expertise and create conservationists that would take over this enterprise and lead Afghanistan in the future. And that's one of the other really good things that we did was actually be able to 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 train up individuals to the point that they're now getting PhDs in the UK, in the United States, uh, and they will be leading leading figures for Afghan conservation. Uh, and they're doing their projects based on Afghanistan and their intentions are to go back. Um, and that's probably some of the most impactful things we can do in the long term is build the capacity. Yeah, absolutely. And so you've done remote field work in Madagascar. You've done science, foreign service work in Russia and Iraq. And you spent time in Afghanistan doing wildlife surveys and setting up new national parks. So my question for you is, is there a global region that's kind of tickling your brain that you're thinking about for the future? Or are you mostly uh, concentrated on your work at Conservation X Labs? Well, you know, one, one of, um, it's a great question. There's a lot of really interesting places. I obviously wouldn't mind going back to Madagascar because it's a place that's near and dear to my heart, but it's also a place so when I left Madagascar in 2003, there were 45 known species of lemur and 90% of the forest has been cut. There's now, it's now known to be that it has 105 species of lemurs. Oh, so wow. we've doubled the amount of primates, you know, in a fairly short period of time in a place where, where again, you know, 90 to 95% of the forests have been cut. So just on that remaining five or 10%, we've doubled what you know, what generally we should have a good idea, a large vertebrate or even a small size vertebrate, we should probably know that it is there. Um, but we didn't, which makes me think, you know, how much is left and how much are we losing before we even know that it exists? Mm -hmm. uh, so Madagascar is high on my list and other places like Indonesia, um, places like Papua New Guinea, uh, increasingly our oceans as well as on land are places that we're trying to work uh, and find solutions to. A lot of our work at Conservation X Labs is addressing the underlying drivers of extinction. So we're working on challenges to reinvent the air, the underlying technology for air conditioning, because it's the most impactful thing you could do for climate change. Uh, new tools for using DNA for enforcement of, you know, wildlife trafficking, timber trafficking, fish traceability or detection of invasive species. And, uh, you know, now working on artisanal mining because it's a major source of deforestation in the Congo Basin, Madagascar, and the Amazon uh, for the capacitors that are in your computers. Um, so we are actually starting to work uh, globally, but we tend to work with partners locally. Mm -hmm. But, what, but the, the, if, if there are places that, you know, uh, that really sort of appeal to me, it is places in the midst of change. And these are places, I think, that like Afghanistan, where the opportunity, where a small amount of effort can actually lead to huge and powerful changes. So as I look at countries like Zimbabwe or the Central African Republic, which has serious security challenges, or the Middle East, which actually has a lot of fauna and flora, but we tend to write it off, um, and you know, places like the Caucasus Mountains, these places might be actually really great places to work. They're not where the, a lot of the other conservation organizations are working, but they're places where we can experiment with ideas for conservation, bring in technology and innovation, and try totally different approaches, and be able to have a, a place to, to kind of see what we could do better uh, at the end of the day. So I get excited about 
about places like that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've been talking about your experiences doing conservation all across the world, but especially the ones you focus on in the Snow Leopard Project, which has recently come out. And my last question for you is, where are the proceeds from the Snow Leopard Project book going? Yeah, so, uh, you know, outside of the action, so anything that wasn't spent in terms of costs for the book or licensing of imaging, I'm just giving back to the WCS Afghanistan program. Uh, and it's not very much because authors don't get very much these days, but it, it's essentially doing good for, for a place uh, that is really deserving of, of our attention. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. And honestly, because of you and, and because of your book, we're going to keep following the progress of national parks in Afghanistan and the Middle East. So thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm Erica Zambello, that was Dr. Dagan, and this is National Parks Traveler. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Beaches sparkling white and lined with palm trees. Warm Caribbean waters, tinted turquoise, and flecked with darting blue tangs. Schools of yellow sergeant majors and luminescent green parrotfish. Coral reefs swaying in the currents with their fans and given depth and texture by brain, staghorn, and elkhorn corals. These all make Virgin Islands National Park a tropical paradise. It is one with a rich, though at times dark, history with chapters that delve into slavery and pirating, a history whose stories reside in the ruins of sugarcane plantations that once covered the island of St. John, in bays and coves that were visited by pirates, in rock faces into which petroglyphs were hammered by ancient cultures. These are the vignettes from the past that, when threaded together, help tell the story of European domination of paradise, of lost cultures and their beliefs, of a landscape that might have been found in Robert Louis Stevenson's treasure island. Today, the island with its national park is a fount of relaxation and rejuvenation, with more than a little fun mixed in. While nearby St. Thomas might be the cruise capital of the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. John is where you head to flee most of the throngs of tourists. My wife and I fell in love with this tropical gem during a too short one-week stay on St. John. It was too short because there were more reefs, beaches, ruins, and restaurants for us to explore. Too short because it was still snowing back home, and on St. John the sun was warm and the trails and waters inviting. Though the National Park covers only about 7,000 acres of St. John, an island that itself covers only about 20 square miles, the National Park seems to go on and on, no doubt in part because of the lack of roads. 
Cruise Bay is the big city on the island and where your ferry ride from St. Thomas ends. It's a small town with narrow streets, crowded with tourists and locals in their rigs. It's also where you'll find park headquarters with its maps, guidebooks, and other tools for orienting yourself to the national park, and some great restaurants. Beyond Cruise Bay, the park with its sparkling beaches and densely forested mountainsides awaits. If you manage to find your way down to St. John in the National Park in the coming months, here are some suggestions for you. To prepare for the trip, study the park's website, pick up a guidebook or two. If you want a guided tour of St. John, reach out to Jen at St. John Island Tours. She can lead you around St. John. And don't forget to toss your National Park passport into your bag. It can be stamped at the park's visitor center right there in Cruise Bay where the ferry docks. Where should you stay? You might consider renting a house which marketers refer to as villas. Time your visit for the off-season, and you can find a nice one for about $200 a night, though the prices do rocket up from there, depending on how much luxury you want. When you consider the full kitchen, the laundry room, and the two or three bedrooms, and more than likely the deck and the barbecue, you'll appreciate being able to flee the resort life and save a little money cooking for yourself when the mood strikes. There are a good number of companies that handle these rentals, you can find them by searching for St. John Villas. If you prefer to camp, check on the status of the Cinnamon Bay Campground with the park staff at 340-776-6201, extension 238. Hurricanes Irma and Maria back in September 2017 did substantial damage to the campground, and it's not expected to reopen before December 2020. If you truly like to explore, rent a Jeep to give you some freedom on the island. Just be sure to do it in the weeks before you reach the island to make sure that one will be ready waiting for you. True, there are bus-like open-air taxis that will take you from Cruise Bay all the way out to Cinnamon Bay and even, I believe, the Annenberg Sugar Plantation ruin. But if you want to check out other places, say Coral Bay or Great Lampshire Beach, you'll need your own wheels. While there are plenty of two-door Jeep Wranglers and similar SUVs to be had, you'd probably be better off with a four-door model if there are more than two of you and if you have more than a couple bags. Now, if you're not comfortable driving on the left side of the road or on steep, rutted two-tracks, you might want to forego the rental and ride the taxis. According to the National Park, Vitrin buses travel between Cruise Bay and Salt Pond Bay along Centerline Road. The buses leave the public ferry dock at Cruise Bay at 6 a.m. and 7 a.m., and then at 25 minutes past the hour until 7.25 p.m., Monday through Friday, most weeks. Take some time to learn to snorkel. It's not hard, and it's the best way to explore the treasures that lie beneath the surface. With snorkel, mask, and fins in hand, you'll be able to slip into another dimension, one that us air breathers don't spend a lot of time in. You can spend a lot, or a comparatively little, say in the $100 range, for your own gear. How much you spend should be measured against how likely you are to get wet again after leaving the park. If you already love to snorkel or are bitten by the bug once you arrive at St. John, don't overlook a day trip to Salt Pond Bay. This arguably is the best beach for snorkeling, lying about, and fleeing the crowds. Get there before 10 a.m. for a prime selection of shaded spots, some with picnic tables, to serve as your base camp for the day. Then you can swim either out to the rocky point below Ram Head or out to the nearly submerged rock outcrops near the bay's mouth for some great coral displays of elkhorn and staghorn corals, as well as brain corals, which look like, well, brains. Another great spot for snorkeling, I'm told, is Virgin Islands Coral Reef National Monument on the far side of St. John. This is one of the reasons why a one-week vacation usually isn't enough. We didn't have time to swim there. The 12,708-acre monument was designated in January 2001 and encompasses submerged lands within the three-mile belt off of the island of St. John. These waters support a diverse and complex system of coral reefs and other ecosystems, such as shoreline mangrove forests and seagrass beds that contribute to their health and survival. The only part of the monument accessible by land is in Hurricane Hole. To get to Hurricane Hole, just follow Route 10 from Cruise Bay to the Estate Hermitage. Now, if you do snorkel, consider wearing a t-shirt. With all that time bobbing face down near the water's surface, you're likely to toast your back without adequate precaution. 
and a t-shirt is much more reliable than sunblock that could eventually wash off. And when you shop for sunblock, get one that's ecologically sound for the waters, one that doesn't have chemicals that could be damaging to the coral reefs. If you have the time and the budget, consider a snorkeling tour of the waters surrounding the islands. These can be arranged through private outfits that typically use sailboats to carry you to offshore reefs. These reefs could be more colorful than those closer to shore, as I'm told the waters offshore aren't quite as warm and so aren't bleaching the corals. Definitely check out Trunk Bay. True, it's the best known of the National Park's beaches and arguably the most crowded. But how can you travel all the way to St. John without visiting it? In the warm waters of the cove, there's an underwater trail of sorts that makes it easy for you to identify some of the corals and fishes to be found in the park's waters. And while there's no campground at Trunk Bay, there are changing facilities and showers, picnic tables with barbecue grills, even a gift shop. To avoid the crowds, arrive early, say before 9 or late after 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The light is great both times of the day, and you'll be able to enjoy a little more elbow room, whether you're simply sitting on the beach with a book or trying to navigate the underwater trail. Be sure to spend some time venturing off the beaten path. While the Annenberg ruins definitely should be on your to-do list, the Catherineburg ruins off Center Line Road provide another rich perspective of the 18th century plantation life on the island, as do the Reef Bay ruins, which require a hike down the Reef Bay Trail but it's a welcome walk through a dense tropical forest and takes you past more ruins the forest is steadily taking over. Just don't forget to carry some water and some munchies. Learn to relax. Yes, the island and park both are small enough to rush through in a handful of days and come away with some great memories. But at least one or two of those memories should be packing up a picnic lunch, your snorkel gear, sand chairs or mats, and beach umbrella and heading to one of the great beaches to spend the day moving between the water and your spot on the shore. And be sure to spend some time hiking. While the Reef Bay Trail is one of the more popular paths in the National Park, a shorter trail that pays off with some great views of Trunk Bay and out into the Caribbean is the roughly 10-minute walk up Peace Hill. Found just short of three miles from Cruz Bay, the trail leads to the top of a bluff where there's an old sugar mill tower. There used to be a larger-than-life statue of Christ of the Caribbean across from the tower ruins, but Hurricane Marilyn destroyed it back in 1995. Also, be sure to check with the visitor center at Cruise Bay to see about any ranger-led activities during your stay there. You also might inquire about visiting the archaeology lab at Cinnamon Bay. There you'll find some artifacts from digs in the park. Virgin Islands National Park truly is one of the gems in the national park system and offers much in terms of natural and cultural resources. It is an incredibly relaxing paradise. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. And now, the commentary.
For five days back in August, I was surrounded by nature. Along with my wife and oldest son and three close friends, we headed by kayak and canoe to Shoshone Lake in Yellowstone National Park. It's said that Shoshone Lake, which covers a bit more than 8,000 acres, or nearly 13 square miles, is the country's largest lake that you can't reach unless you're wearing hiking boots or wielding a kayak or canoe paddle. In other words, visiting the lake with its surrounding mountains is like stepping back into the early 18th century, with the Continental Divide skirting the lake to the north and east, and the even more remote Pitchstone Plateau to the south, we were truly embraced by wildness and nature. There we were in the realm of osprey, bald eagles, and loons, of elusive pine martens, and the occasional grizzly. As wonderfully wild as that setting is, there are not many others like it in the United States. U.S. Senators Tom Udall of New Mexico and Michael Bennett of Colorado fear that the country faces what they call a conservation and climate crisis, with nature in steep decline and greenhouse gas emissions not declining at the rate scientists say is needed in the United States and worldwide to battle climate change. According to the two, from 2001 to 2017, a quantity of natural areas equal to the size of a football field was lost to development every 30 seconds in the United States, constituting more than 1.5 million acres lost each year. More so, the senators maintain that existing protections for land, the ocean, and wildlife in the United States are not sufficient to prevent a further decline of nature in the country. So what should we do? What can we do? The two senators introduced a resolution into the Senate last month, the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature, stating that the federal government should establish a national goal of conserving at least 30% of the land and 30% of the ocean within the territory of the United States by the year 2030. No doubt that's a fairly lofty goal. How can it be reached? Can it be reached? The senators want to involve federal agencies, local communities, Indian tribes, states, and private landowners to conserve natural places and resources under their control. They also want to see public incentives established for private landowners to voluntarily conserve and protect areas of demonstrated conservation value and with a high capacity to sequester carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. One of the resolution's co-sponsors, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, believes that it's our moral obligation to leave future generations with an inhabitable planet. If we are to take this commitment seriously, he says, we must ensure that we prioritize the conservation of our nation's land and water. If you've visited Shoshone Lake or the backcountry of such parks as Yosemite or Great Smoky Mountains or Everglades, you can appreciate the benefits of reaching that goal. And certainly, you no doubt want your children and grandchildren to enjoy those pristine settings just as you have. That's our show for this week. We invite you to share your thoughts and comments on nationalparkstraveler.org at the bottom of this week's podcast episode. Next week, we'll be talking Yellowstone wolves with the park's wolf biologist, Doug Smith. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Rebencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.